We kicked off this series five weeks ago called More Than This, and this series has been all about helping us get traction on living intentionally with purpose in our lives for God. We all want to live a life for pur- with purpose, and, and hopefully over these last weeks, you've gotten some more traction and clarity on how you can practically live your life and make a difference for God, how your, God, how your life can, can make an impact, how your life can be about the purposes of God. If you remember the first week in this series, and you can go back and watch all these messages online. I know you'll be running out of here as soon as we're done to go home and watch them. Uh, But uh, no laugh that time. Great. That's awesome. I'm being funny today. Uh, Thank you. Um, So anyway, the first message we talked about uh, how the way we live a life with purpose is to choose God and his kingdom first. Jesus said, seek first my kingdom and and my righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And so step one is you got to seek God. You got to seek his kingdom, not your kingdom, his kingdom. In week two, we looked at the gospel of John and we talked about the interaction Jesus has with the woman at the well. And when Jesus meets this woman, she's a woman with with a baggage, a bunch of baggage and and a difficult past. But when she encounters Jesus, she realizes and recognizes that her life has value and meaning and purpose. And God transforms her and she begins to live differently. She has a new identity. In week three, we talked about identity and how oftentimes in this life, whether it's success or failure, things happen and we lose our way. We lose our identity in Christ and we start to try to find our identity in success or in our failures or in some other type of person or in in some kind of an achievement rather than in Jesus. And when that happens in our lives, we lose our way, we lose our purpose. And then, of course, last week we talked about King David in the Old Testament and how if you want to live a life of purpose, then you must seek God with all your heart. And David gives us that example through the ups and downs in the life of David through extreme success and extreme failure. He continued to pursue the heart of God. And we talked about are you pursuing the heart of God? So we've been talking about purpose the last few weeks, and today we're going to put a bow on this thing and wrap it up. But what I'm going to talk about, I believe, is critical if you're going to live a life with intentional purpose. If you're going to live your life focused on the things of God and living with intentional purpose, the thing I'm going to talk about today is critical for that. And what we're going to talk about today is the church, the body of Christ. You see, I don't know if you realize this or not, but the church is the hope of the world. The church is the hope of the world. And I'm going to give you two reasons. I could give you a lot of reasons of why the church is the hope of the world, but these hopefully will help you. The first reason I want you to see this and know this is, number one, the church is the deliverer of good news. The church is what God created and who he has called to deliver the message of what Jesus did on the cross and through the resurrection. It is the church. The church is the deliverer of the hope. Without the church, how will the hope of Jesus get to the people? The church is the hope of the world. And if we as Christ followers are not part of that church, if we're not part of what God is doing, then we can't live the purpose that God has called us to live. Not only are we the deliverer of the good news, the church, the church is also the physical representation of Jesus on the earth. You see, Jesus physically lived on earth 2,000 years ago. He walked on planet earth. He was born. He lived. He did ministry. He preached. He healed people. He he changed people's lives. He died on the cross. He was resurrected from the dead. But Jesus now is at the right hand of God the Father. And Jesus established his church, us, the people of God, to represent him in the world. And so the church is literally the physical representation of Jesus in the world. As we live our lives, as we go into the business world, as we go into the world, we physically represent Jesus to the world. The church is the hope of the world. Now I want to be clear about something. The church is not a building. This facility is not the church. Now we, re- we reference it as our church But it's simply the place, the building where we, the people of God, come together to gather. 
It is the gathering place of the church, but this building is, is not the church. You know what the church is? The church is you. The church is me. We, as the individual Christians, followers of Jesus, choose to make up this local body of believers, this local church. We are the church, and we as the individual people who make up this body, we represent Jesus to the world. If we don't, who will? The church is the hope of the world. And it matters that you and I aren't just observers in a church, but we are actually participants in a church. Simply observing doesn't move the ball down the field. It doesn't get us in the end zone. Participating, being part of the body, being part of the church is what gets us to where we need to be. You see, if we claim the name of Jesus as a Christ follower, if you today say, I am a Jesus follower, I'm a Jesus person, I am a Christian, but you're not committed to the church, then you, me, we are neglecting the hope that the world needs. Guys, the world is broken. People are desperate for hope. The world is divided. Turn on the news, the division, the brokenness of our society, not just in America, but around the world. We live in a broken world. The Bible describes this. It happens, it began in Genesis chapter 3. But Jesus came to bring healing and hope. And he came and he said, I'm establishing my church and my church will be the deliverer of the hope. You see, we're not ever going to fix all the problems in the world. But we have the answer to the eternal hope that people need, and that is relationship with Jesus. The church is the hope of the world. So as we talk about living a life that's more than this, you know, so often we get trapped in the, I wake up, I eat breakfast, I go to work, I come home, I eat, I sleep, I do it again. Repeat, repeat, repeat. The mundane rhythm of life. You see, there's gotta be more than just existing there's a purpose that God has created you for and us for, and that purpose is to live for him, to make much of him, and to spread his message to the world. The church is the organized body of believers that he established himself to do that. The hard part is we love me, right? I love myself, but to be part of a church means to choose others over myself, but I love me. I mean, I can't tell you how much I love me. I mean, it's a lot. You know, and you love you. And so often we get caught up in this trap of choosing ourselves over the things of God and what God has called us to. I know that's true in my life. I can think back, and even as a pastor, wrestling with my selfish decisions to choose me over the purpose of God. But I want you to know today that purpose is found in choosing others. And being part of the church is about choosing other people. That's the very essence of what Jesus talked about in the two greatest commandments. Two greatest commandments. Jesus was asked, what, what's the most important commandment, Jesus? And, and his response in Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Jesus replied to that and he said this. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 40, all the law and prophets hang on these two commands. Everything hangs on this. Everything hangs on love, on choosing to love God supremely and to love others second. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't love yourself. Notice what it says in there, and I'm not going to get deep into teaching into this today, but it talks about to love others as you love yourself. So the Bible actually does teach you to love yourself. Don't be a self-hater. You know, don't go live in a hole and hide and think that you're, you know, no, you have value. You, you, God loves you. He came to rescue you. But in our lives as the body of Christ, the very essence of the two greatest commandments are given for us to love God and to love each other. So what about you today? When you think about your life, your decisions, how you're living are you factoring God? Are you factoring in the body of Christ, the church? As I reflect on this, it's so easy to get sidetracked and to get self-consumed and, and to forget about the importance of what God has called us to be about. So as you reflect on your life today, are you focused on your glory or, or God's? 
If you're anything like me, it's easy to quickly lose focus. As you think about what you've been given, you see, each one of us have been entrusted with this life and everything we have. As you think about your time, are you giving any of that time to the things of God, to the church? And, and, and don't mishear me. I'm not just talking about, are you, are you coming up here and volunteering for this event or that event? I'm asking you, are you giving your life to other people who make up the body of Christ? Are you investing your life into other people? Are, are you investing in the kingdom of God? Are you investing your life by inviting people to join the family? Are you using your time? Are you using your money? What you've been entrusted with you know, Jesus talked more about money than heaven and hell combined. I wonder why. He knows we love it. I mean, we love money. We love it. It makes us do crazy stuff. It makes us run over people, cheat people, do people wrong. And if it controls you, if it owns you, it'll eat you up. How are you using what you've been entrusted with to make much of Jesus, your energy. Every one of us have energy and how we manage and leverage that for the kingdom of God, our talents, our gifts, our careers. God gave you the career you have so that you could make much of him and to build his church. That's why he gave it to you. You're in the place you're in with the relationships you have for a specific purpose and that purpose is the glory of God alone. If you miss that, you miss the point of why he gave you the career. He didn't just give it to you so you could be awesome at whatever it is you do. He gave it to you so that you could represent him where you are. So you could touch the people that work with you that are broken and hopeless and hungry for, for God. And they may not even realize it, but you see it because you have what Christ has done in your heart. And you want to give that to them. That's what it means to be the church, to live with purpose. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Are we seeking him first? Are we making much of his kingdom, his church? Are our decisions about honoring God and his church or the majority of them about ourselves? Now, I get it. This is an uncomfortable conversation to have because we all struggle with it. Right? We all struggle with it. This is a battle that wages in our heart of will I be committed to the church that God's called me to or will I be committed to my thing? It's, it's a battle that we all struggle with. How will this benefit me? How will this affect me? We think more in that way rather than how will this reach more people for Jesus? Think about it. Think about it. In our church decisions, like when you're thinking about this church right here, how often do you struggle with, I don't know if I like that. I don't know if that fits my, my preference and what I want. Or, or, or are you asking a more important question? Will this help us reach the next generation? Will this help us reach more people with, with the good news of Jesus Christ? Will we go to the nations? Will we go to our neighbors? That's the more important question. It's not how do I like it. It's how will this work to reach people? The very essence of being missionaries, which is what we're called to do. You see, you are a missionary. Corinthians says that we are ambassadors, representatives of Jesus. And in the Great Commission, God calls us out and he commissions us as his church, as his people, to go into the world and spread the message of Christ. So you are a missionary. And here's what a missionary does. A missionary goes into a specific context, a place, and they examine that place. And they say, who are the people in this place who do not have a relationship with Jesus? And what tactics, what strategies must we do to contextualize the message of Jesus Christ to these specific people to reach them with this message? That's what missionaries do. But the church, and I'm speaking in general terms, loses its edge when it starts to think not like that, but to think, what do I like? What's my preference? You die. You die quickly, and you die faster in our culture than any before because the pace is moving so quickly. Change, change, change is happening. So we have to be on the edge. We have to think differently. We have to think like missionaries. I want to tell you something. Vaughn Forest Church 
is an important church. And I don't say that because I'm here, but I say that because we must choose differently. We must choose to be on the edge. We must choose to say we will think outside the box and we won't just be comfortable. We won't just, you know, be like another church down the road or on the street that just adopts whatever it is that we enjoy or like, but that we will be on the edge thinking, what is it going to take to reach my neighbor who's far from God? What's it going to take to reach my coworker who's far from God? Because if we miss that, we miss everything. We don't exist on planet earth for our church enjoyment. We exist to be the church, the representation of Jesus Christ to the world. Will we be missionaries or not? Will we be participants or observers? First service didn't get that, so you guys got that little extra. So good for you. God's word challenges us on this. How will we impact the world This is uncomfortable because we all struggle with it. Now, I'm not saying those aren't important factors. Don't mishear what I said. I'm not saying you should go, gosh, I hate this church. That guy can't preach. We know that, okay? We know all those things. You got to be somewhere where you believe in what they're doing, okay? Believe in what they're teaching. But we've got to be on the edge, folks. Whether it's me up here or one day somebody else leading this church, we've got to be on the edge. We gotta be on the edge. Once you lose your edge and you kick back in the recliner, you're done. You're toast. You know what? You may have fat money in the bank and you may have people showing up, bless them. But if you ain't reaching people who don't know Jesus, you've lost it. If you're not, if you're not sending people into the neighborhoods and the nations, you've lost it. We won't lose it. We've got, it's too important. The call is too important. Will you be part of what God's telling you to do? So here's what I'm going to ask you today. Here's our big question. Are you offering yourself to the body of Christ? Think about your life right now. Am I offering my life to the body of Christ, to the church? Here's what I want everybody to do, this connection card. You got one when you came in, when you got your bullets, and everybody take that out right now. And here's, here's what I want every person to do. On the back, it says next steps. The fourth thing down says, I would like to sign up for next step class. There's also down there, I would like to become a member of Unforced. At some point in this service, if you are not a member of this church, I want to challenge you to think about checking that off and being part of our next Next Step class. And I'm going to talk more about that in a minute, but I wanted to bring that up as I ask you this question. Are you offering yourself? Because I want you to be a member of Unforced. I want you to be a change maker. I want you to be a part of this body, a part of what God is doing, not just observing, but participating And this is exactly what Paul would talk about in Romans 12 as he would explain to the church in Rome about the church. The church in Rome was a very eclectic group like us, made up from all races and all places, all different kinds of backgrounds. They had Jewish people. They had Gentile people. They were a port city. They had people from everywhere. It was a wild and crazy place, kind of like America. And Paul is teaching them about what it means to be the church. And so these verses are so relevant to us today. And this is what he tells them, verse 3 through 13 of chapter 12 in Romans. I'm going to walk through each one of these verses and break them down for us, okay? Paul writes and he says, For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Now, this is a really important, interesting thing where he says sober judgment. Because that is directing toward, obviously, there's, there's something going on. There's an intoxication with self. There's some egomaniacs amongst them. Probably like me. Probably maybe a little bit like you. We all struggle with that, right? And Paul is saying, listen, I know your tendency is to be an egomaniac. I know your tendency is to think about you above all else. And then he goes on. Well, I want to read Philippians 2 where they're talking about, um, Paul talks about this when he's referencing to the humility of Jesus, he says this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. See, we're supposed to have this posture of humility and service and offering our lives, not being egomaniacs like I have the tendency of being, but being like Jesus. He goes on in Romans chapter 12, verse four through five, and he says, Now, this is where he starts to explain the church, guys. He says, just as each 
of us has one body with many members, and these members do not ha all have the same function. Pause. Each one of us today has a body. If you didn't have a body, you wouldn't be here. Everybody's got a body. I want you to move your fingers right now. Move your fingers. Move your legs as much as you can, crammed up in those little seats. All right, you got that. You got a hand, you got hands, you got feet, you got, you've got a body. Now, here's what I want you to know. Your body has many members. Your physical body has many members. It has fingers, it has arms, it has legs, and every one of those members are important for function. I promise you, you want every one of them that you've got. It makes life a lot more difficult to live when you're missing members of the body. My cousin, when we were eight years old, we were, we were super close growing up. My, my mom's sister, my family was very tight, and my cousin, when he was eight, almost nine years old, was diagnosed with a very rare form of cancer. And we, were, we, we played ball, we played baseball like it was going out of style. We loved it, he loved it. He was a great athlete. And unfortunately, the tumor that he had was right here. And it grew quickly to the size of a football and they had to remove not just his arm, but almost his whole shoulder when he was nine years old. I remember being at St. Jude and just sitting there seeing him sick and being around all those kids. It was so heartbreaking. It was really, really tough. And um, I can remember the pain that he went through and, and, and the difficulty of that, but it's a miracle that he's still alive today. We're the same age and he's, he's still alive. But from that point on, there was this guy in Memphis that began to train him on how to play baseball with one arm. This guy was famously known for Bo Jackson ending his career. He slid into him in the minor leagues and uh, ended his career somehow with his leg. And then this guy devoted his life to train young athletes. He still does it in Memphis. I can't even remember his name, Tim somebody, but he's known all over the Memphis area. And so my cousin started going to this guy and the guy said, I wanna do this for free for you. And he trained my cousin how to play baseball. And my cousin played baseball all of his childhood, all the way through high school. But when he lost his arm and, and he still doesn't have an arm, it changed his life. He can't function the same way he could before he had both arms. I will brag on my cousin though. The amazing thing is he learned to play baseball and he hit like this. He batted over 300 in high school. Over 300, I've seen him hit a home run in a game, 300 something feet, like this, amazing. He played first base, he started for several years at first base on his high school team. He could catch the ball, now remember he was right-handed, lost his right arm, he could catch the ball with his right hand, flip his glove in the air, catch the ball and throw it as fast as you could do this. It was unbelievable, I mean just like mind-blowing, he played high school football, just amazing what he did and how he overcame that struggle, but when he lost his arm, it changed his life. When you lose a member of your body, you can't function the same way. It makes it more difficult to do the things you need to do. And as Paul is describing the church, I want you to see this. We are the physical representation of Jesus Christ in the world. We are the body of Christ. And each one of us makes up a different member of the body, whether we're a finger, a toe, an ear, an eye, an arm, a leg. I don't know what member you are. But he goes on in verse 5 and he says, So in Christ, we who are many form one body. We form one body and each member, each member of the body belongs to all the others. You see, my hand belongs to my knee. And my knee belongs to my shoulder. And my head belongs to my chest. All these pieces I'm happy that I have and they belong to each other. They are connected. And I believe this is the greatest reason that the church is, is, is struggling in America. One of, I could give you about five. But one of the greatest reasons is because we are a body that is not functioning fully because members of the body aren't participating. They're like having a dead arm that you can't use. It's just dangling there. It's really more trouble than it's worth, you know? It's just hanging there. And, and here's what I want you to see. As we are the body of Christ, each members of the body, and we represent Jesus in the world, it is, it is absolutely essential that you do your part. 
You have something important to bring to the table. If you don't, if you don't participate, it hurts the kingdom. You may go, yeah, Eric, but I really am not that good at anything. Listen, the thing that you do that you may think is small that no one ever sees may have more impact than the sermon I preach today. Don't downplay what God's doing in your life. Don't downplay what God will do in and through you as you simply say, Lord, I'm yours. Wherever I go, wherever I am, I will just simply serve you with what I have. You see, we, we in this populist culture, we like to rank the gifts. You think, oh, the preacher. Wow, if somebody can really speak, then they're more important. Their gift is more. No, it's not more important. Every gift is important. I love my foot, but my head, okay, I need it. But I like them all. You know, I like every member. And, you know, before I came here when I, when I was a church planner, we, we ended up not calling our church members members. But the more I've studied Scripture, now I really believe the term member is very important. It's not a secular term that the church made up like some country club. It comes straight from Scripture that every one of us have members of our body and we make up this church. Every one of us have something important to bring to the table. We cannot function to our maxim, maximum capacity without you. Don't think that what you bring is not important. We need you. We can't do what God's called us to do unless everybody is engaged. 1 Peter 4, 10, I love this verse. It says, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in various forms. I quote that verse a lot because I love it, because I, it, it, it reminds us that each one of us have been given different gifts. And I want you to see your life as this. You are, as a Jesus follower, are a member of the body of Christ. You must be engaged in a local body like this one. If it's not this one, get in another one, but be engaged in a local body and use the gifts that God has given you to do this, to administer, to give out the grace of God. If we don't do that, who's giving the grace? Who's distributing the good news? He goes on in Romans 12, 6 through 8, and he says, we all have different gifts. Pretty much the same thing 1 Peter said. According to the grace given to each of us, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve it. If it's teaching, then teach. If it is encouragement, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Now, Paul's goal is not to break down each gift and, and, and show you the minute details of these. His point in this text is to say, we all got different gifts. Use what you've been given and maximize it for the glory of God. You've been given what you've been given for a purpose. And when God gave it to you, he knew where you would be, he knew who you would be, and he gave it to you to serve in a local church, in a body of Christ. Are you doing that? Are you offering yourself to God? Now, when you read this, I want to point this out because you could use this as a cop-out. You could say, well, my gift isn't serving, <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. Now, there are some things that the Bible commands that Jesus says, you know, these are things you do. You serve, you give. As Paul is describing these gifts, so there are people who have this extra level of being able to just serve above and beyond. If that's what God's called you to do, you've met them, right? They're incredible. They're called mom. We'll celebrate them next week. God has just given mom something special. But, but, but they have this ability to serve beyond. It's not giving you an out like, well, I don't have that gift. I don't need it. Or I don't have the gift to give, so I'll let somebody else take care of that. No, we're all called to, to be a part of these things. But some of us do have the ability and potential where we can give way beyond what other people can. And God's put that in your heart to be a generous giver. Do it diligently for the Lord. Paul continues to give us insight into these verses of how to live as the body of Christ. And so we know that we're this body. We're made up of all these different members, and each member is important. And, and God wants you to, to use what you've been given. If you want to live with purpose, use what you've been given to, to serve his church, to serve the body of Christ. He goes on in verse 9 and 10, and he talks about how we're to operate amongst each other. He says, love must be sincere. This idea is don't be deceptive. We don't love for our benefit. It must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. 
We, we, there's a lot of evil things in the world and we've got to reject those things and we've got to cling to the good, the cross, the glory of God. He goes on in verse 10, he says, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. There it is again. Honor, your, honor others above yourselves. As you look at these verses in the original language, you discover Paul's not talking about this being a one-time commitment. It's not like, hey, love them one time, serve them one time. No, this is an ongoing, continuous way of life as we operate amongst each other as the body of Christ that make up the church. It is vitally important that each local church serve in that way. Now, I want to point something out that's really important because you may be going, I don't have to be part of any kind of local church. I can just... I like the sermon series you're doing this week. I'll come here next week. I'll be over there. And the next week I'll be over there. Now that's just not logical. That's called, I want to get out of being responsible for anything. And I want to sit on my butt. That's what that's called. And check this out. I want you to think about it in this logical, practical way. You've got a family, right? I come from the Smiths. I'm a Smith. There's about 500 million of us on planet earth. We're Smiths. But in my little Smith family, there's a family tree. You know, you've got the weird cousins. Everybody's got those. You got the smart ones, and then you got you. <clears throat> Just kidding. I'm usually in the weird one. But, you know, you, you can think about your aunts, your uncles. You got this family tree, and everybody in the family is part of the family. They're all part of the family. You see, each church, each local church, yes, is part of the church, the big C church. But you can't be out here outside of the family tree doing your own thing and think you're part of the tree. God wants you to be part of a local church. If you want to debate me on that one, baby, we can go at it. Because there's too much scripture that backs me up and zero that backs you up. So quit justifying this in your life. It's a cultural, cool thing to do. I get it. Because it gets you out of any responsibility. But you know what it doesn't, does too? It gets you out of purpose. You're missing your purpose because you're justifying laziness. Now, I know that's hard to hear and that's hard to say, but I got to say it because it concerns my heart. Not for this church, but for the church. It concerns my heart. I think it's, I think it's an epidemic in America. We treat the church like a vending machine, like she exists for us. We are us. We are her. It's like using your own family for your own benefit. It's not what God has called us to. Jesus said this in John 13, 35, by this all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Let me ask you, are you offering yourself to the church? Are you offering yourself to the body of Christ? If it isn't this church, find one, man. Offer yourself to the church. Offer yourself to to convince yourself that you're offering yourself to God, but you don't offer yourself to the local church is like dating a girl you don't hang out with. It's like your imaginary girlfriend. Guys, I know some of you have one. I'm sorry. I had some of those in elementary school. I wanted her to love me so bad, but she wouldn't have me. I don't know what was wrong with her. John 3.30 John the Baptist shows us the way he says, he must increase, I must decrease. You see, that's what it means to be part of the body. That's what it means to be part of the church. Are you offering yourself to the body of Christ? I want you guys to use your imagination as I wrap this up this morning. Imagine if a church actually did this. Imagine if we said, you know what? I'm going to be committed to the local church. I'm going to devote myself and I'm going to say, Lord, I have gifts, I have resources, I have everything you've entrusted me with, and I'm going to use it for your glory. Now, that doesn't mean it happens in these four walls. It happens in the city, in our workplaces. We represent Jesus as this body to, to make much of him. It's by investing and inviting so that people can hear the good news of Jesus Christ. It's in all those ways. It's serving other people that are our neighbors that we work with. It's serving those who you're in life group with. It's serving God in all these different ways to make much of Jesus. Are you offering your life, yourself, to the body of Christ? Because purpose is found in choosing others. I want to challenge you as I wrap this up. Take out that connection card again. On the back it says, I would like to sign up for next step class. If you're simply an observer, 
I want you to become a member. Not so I can check some list on a computer. Listen, we delete people constantly out of our database. We're not interested in having the biggest database in the world. We could have 30,000 people's names in our database. It would do me no good. When I do a mass mailer, it would just cost a whole lot more money. That's not the goal. The goal is not some big number in a database. How many members you got, brother? Well, I got this many. <laughs> well, good for you. I don't care about members. I care about engagement. I don't care about members in a computer system. I care about you being part of what God is doing. This isn't about us, this is about you. It's about we, it's about the church. If you're not part of that, we wanna help you. If you don't know what your gift is, guess what? We do step one, which is member step two. It's a two week thing that we offer about once a month on Sunday mornings. You sign up, we'll contact you to be in the next one. We do a spiritual gift assessment and we do a disc profile to help you understand your personality. Better to know where you can serve. We wanna help you. This is about building lives that honor God. It's about the great commission. It's about what Jesus has called us to, to make disciples. I wanna challenge everybody. If you're not a member of this church, take the next step. Get in the game. Help us do what God's called us to do. If you are a member, but you're just observing, I want you to just take some self-examination and just engage again. Engage again. Serve. Give. And you know what the beautiful thing is? Each one of us are unique and different. And if we will just simply do what God says, don't do what I say, do what God tells you to do, amazing things will happen. Amazing things will happen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. It's challenging. It challenges me, Lord. And um, so often I, I struggle with this. I wanna choose myself over you, Lord. I wanna choose myself over your body. But help me to love you and to love others. Help me to choose what's good for your kingdom and your church. So for each one of us, Lord, I pray that you would stir in our hearts to make a commitment to a local body of believers to actually engage ourselves, not to just observe, but to truly engage, to say, Lord, I wanna be part of what you're doing in the world. Lord, I just pray that you would move in each one of our lives in that way and that we would just simply do whatever it is you want us to do, whether it's joining this church or re-engaging or whatever it might be. I ask that you would do that. And I ask this in the name of Jesus, amen.